Good morning. I was told I don't talk into the microphone, so I'm going to overly talk into the microphone. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, I know it's early, and it's good to see everybody. And uh, this is Things We Learned. And this is, it is an Atomic Dust uh, presentation series around the ideas of marketing and design. A lot of times we have conversations with friends and clients uh, about sort of emerging topics and uh, kind of philosophy of design. So we just like to take everything we've been talking about lately and bundle it into a presentation and see how many people we can get out early in the morning. It's impressive. Very impressive. <clears throat> so there's jokes along the way, and I'm going to try to figure out this remote. <clears throat> so uh, today we're going to talk about experience design, uh, which is really sort of the journey your customers go through as they interact with your brand. Uh, and it's your, your brand's attempt to shape that experience into the most positive, uh, desirable, repeatable experience that, uh, that you can get. So I'm Mike, I'm Mike Spukowski. I am partner and creative director at Atomic Dust. And I'm Tara Nesbitt, and I'm Community Events Manager at Atomic Dust. We've been practicing that intro for days now. Well, I think it's been like I a month of practice. It. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. they clapped at that. So Atomic Dust has been around for 15 years, uh, which is crazy to think about. Uh, and probably our story starts 10 years ago. Uh, I like to do, uh, it was 2006, I like to do simple math in, in the morning. Uh, but when I first heard the term UX design, and it might have been uh, further, it might have been around for a, a while, um, beyond, well, before 2006, but it's, it was sort of new to me, and I started to realize this, but um, UX design, essentially, uh, to, to boil it down, does anyone here have a great definition of UX design? Everyone knows what it is? No? Okay. So UX design is sort of, uh, in my mind, looking at a website or a digital product and trying to make a user-centered experience around it. So it's sort of the art of like looking at uh, uh, the ease of use, the, the art of sort of improving uh, desirable actions, and the art of trying to improve uh, analytics and conversion. So if you want more people to, to, to buy and sell, you can say, we changed these buttons and the conversion rate went up 1%. And it's sort of this, this study and this practice of making good user-centered experiences. <clears throat> but in 2006, I didn't really believe it. Uh, in 2006, we were probably one of about 100 different agencies in St. Louis. St. Louis has tremendous agencies and great creative talent. Uh, by the way, and we're, we're glad to be part of it. But most of it is, is siloed into disciplines. So there's ad agencies, and there's branding companies, and there's web shops, and there's uh, video companies. And usually you kind of know, we're all creative, but you kind of know who like competitors are and who like-minded designers are. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so I remember around 2006, there's this one company that popped up that said, we're UX designers. And it kind of blew my mind because it was, it was sort of new. And it wasn't just in St. Louis, but all over the country, these things were popping up. And sometimes uh, it, it takes us a while to adopt. Uh, but these guys were saying, we're UX designers, which I thought was a way not for them to really talk about UX design, but a way for them to position themselves against all these other firms, which is really smart and, and it's good, but to me, uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were jerks. <coughs> jerks is a business term. Uh, so to me, these guys like declaring this specialty around this sort of brand new buzzword uh, was just sort of, uh, just made me kind of angry. Because what I thought they were saying is that through UX design, we can predict user behavior. A lot of times when, when firms, or when companies hire design firms, it's to increase sales. And I thought what they were saying is if you hire us, there's this guarantee increase. And that's not always like the, the way the world works, but I thought that that's kind of what they were declaring. And I was wrong, but, uh, but I thought it was, it was a terrible thing, and I thought it was a bunch of crap. This is my, my curse word for today. I can't spell. Uh, I thought it was crap because, um, you know, as an agency, everyone has their own ego, and all agencies think the same way, but it was like, we have better work, and we have smarter people, and we work harder, and we make better websites, and we're, we've always been user-focused, and we're always, you know, hell-bent on conversion, and all these, like, best practices that are just designed, we thought these people bundled up as just one little niche. Uh, so, to us, user experience was just part of good design. I think over the last, 
probably 30 years, design is this practice that has been fragmented into di different disciplines more than most professions. So it's like, you know, it used to be like, I'm a designer, or I'm a graphic designer, or a uh, commercial artist, or something like that. But now it's like, I'm into branding, or I'm into UI design, or I'm into UX design, or I'm a, uh, into development. It, it, it's, it just keeps getting segmented. And I thought user experience was just another way to try to segment it further, and I thought it was kind of uh, not the best idea. I, I would think that good design is all you need. Of course, you want websites to be more conversion focused, and of course, you want them to be uh, engaging, and of course, you want them to be easy to use. And it's just sort of these ideas that uh, that I had as a given, um, where yeah, yeah, we're just sort of basic design, you know, requirements to be a professional designer. Web's f uh, the web and marketing is always full of buzzwords, and I try to pull some of these cherries from 2006. Uh, bricks and clicks, does anybody remember bricks and clicks? It's the idea of having, we're gonna have a physical store and a website that sells. You know, it's revolution. You know, and like dot com, e-tailers, and uh, uh, Jesse's favorite, the cybrary, which is like a cyber library. And so there's all these trends, all these emerging things, and I thought UX design was just sort of part of this this pile. Uh, so also about 10 years ago, uh, I thought that we had a very, uh, that we needed to broaden our view of design. We were, it was our fifth year and we were hiring people and we were getting bigger projects and stuff. And so we started to go to more conferences, right? And I think conferences are a great thing and I think they're a way to gain perspective on um, an industry um, away from the, the bubble and vacuum that most people and ourselves included live in. So. We went to a bunch of conferences, and along the way, uh, we met all these different people. There were all these different designers that all that had all these different niches, and um, I thought it was pretty amazing. I met a woman named Mary Sue who only worked with Canadian retail branding companies, uh, and I, I met uh, John who only did digital product design for well-funded startups, and Richard, who's this guy in Boston who only does user experience design. Uh, and I met the guy who had the most narrow niche focus ever. He only worked with Native American-owned casinos for branding. There's only nine in the country, and those are his client list. But, but uh, I started to see that it wasn't just about like generalist design. It was about applying design to these different practices, and I thought it was kind of kind of cool. And I believed them because they weren't local competitors. There's all this perspective from from all over the country. So I learned that. Uh, there are very, very specific disciplines of design, and they are important. Uh, and then I also learned and realized that the process that, that customers go for, you know, for a generalist website versus a Canadian retail brand is completely different. And that by talking to these people, I learned that uh, when they, they would align how they worked and their expertise to their customers' pain points. And I thought that was really sort of eye-opening. Um, yeah, so I thought these jerks might be onto something. Sorry, this was, that was a joke, Ken. Damn it. Uh, anyway, so I thought they would be onto something, and the idea that they were actually applying a vertical and a specialty, even though I didn't really, uh, at the time, think about it. But now I think it's it's a great thing. Uh, I think when I think of you, when I think of experience design, I tend to put it in terms of branding, right? So when I think about a brand, I think of everything. It's your reputation and your service and your sales and your website and your brochure and, and how you do business and uh, it's just part of this bigger whole and your website's just like one component of it or a brochure is just one piece of it and it's it's not this one thing. And I think with UX design it is just it's the same thing but it's only part of experience design. UX design I guess in my mind is if, if that's the application of how a digital product or a website functions and in, in, in how a user moves through it. It's also uh, just one part of how a customer experiences a brand. So I think looking at the whole, like looking at the whole system, design as a system makes everything stronger. When you, there's more value to it when you, could, when you can kind of determine how people are gonna move uh, through something and how things work in concert together. I think alone design has less value. So if you take you know, a whole sales cycle that's been effective and thought out and, and planned, and then you just pull a brochure from it and say, hey, what do you think of this brochure? It's not, as, it's not as impactful, it's not as valuable, it's not part of a system. So I think it's all kind of you know, experience design. 
Uh, I think businesses, businesses see design as a commodity instead of a strategy, which is kind of harsh. But I think like over the past 20 years, the internet has made uh, businesses care more about design because they think that design can make them more competitive. And I, I think it can make them more competitive. Uh, but I think that, that when they only look at one piece of something, like I need a new website or one email or something, it's, it's usually not as important to them uh, and not as strategic to them as design as a whole. And I think it's really sad. Oh, oh, don't cry, kid. Okay, because I think the beauty of design is going from like where you are to like sort of imagining where you want to be and, and figuring out how you're going to get there. And it's sort of that act and that intent of improvement is the, the uh, sort of the idea of design. It's not just aesthetics or pictures, it's the idea of, of planning and uh, intent to, to arrive somewhere. I think this is how a lot of businesses, not all businesses, but most businesses are set up. There is the strategy table uh, that makes decisions about the actual products and services and how b the business operates. And then there's the creativity table, uh, which is sometimes it's outsourced or seen as a function of marketing or seen as sort of uh, uh, decoration for products. And the creativity table uh, doesn't really have a seat at the strategy table. And I think companies can really benefit from coming, uh, for bringing those things together. Um, so I think design in that act of improvement and getting people in alignment and to see the, a cycle, it brings creativity and strategy together more than, than ever. Uh, so for the last probably year, I'd say we've been hell bent on this idea of how design can be more useful for businesses. Uh, I am on the board of the, uh, the AIGA St. Louis, which is the Professional Association for Design. Uh, and every year, we have this big gallery show, right? This big design show. And it's, it's wonderful. It's great, beautiful work, and the city produces really talented things and, and uh, uh, sorry, amazing things. And last year, uh, you know, it's, it's at COCA, they, uh, they line the walls with all this beautiful design work, and uh, we had a couple pieces in. And then this year, they take it all down and they put up the new stuff. And next year, they'll take it all down and put up the new stuff. And for the last 20 years, they take it all down and put up the new stuff. And I start to think, you know, it's always new, it's always new projects, it's always new. And I try to wonder about the impact the design actually has on the business or the product or the culture of the company. So, it's so you know, we, we were hell-bent on the idea of that design can actually improve businesses. Uh, and we think design can solve uh, business problems. So it's not just aesthetics, uh, it's not just creating artifacts, but it's, it's the idea of, of it's a frame and a lens through looking at, at business challenges. Because uh, we think design can increase sales and shorten sales cycles and add value to products where you could charge more. Uh, and have more customer loyalty so it's easier to, to hold on to customers. Um, and I think, is this you? This you is me. In? We're going to pass the, gonna the pass. remote. Do you want to switch sides and get we'll some switch water? Sides. Switch sides. Yeah. Man, I hope I get a clap at the end. Who knows? I doubt it. I doubt it too. Uh, so as Mike said earlier, experiences are the end-to-end -end interactions that customers have with a brand. Let's see if I can work this clicker right too. So the customer experience journey looks at the from starting point to ending point of how your customers come into your brand and what they experience along the way and where actually they may, might have pain points or they might have opportunities to provide a better experience to the customer. So the thing is that most brands tend to dismiss this. They don't think about the customer experience. And many times brands have maybe thought about it, but they have not revisited it. So we also believe that to be Sad, very oh. sad, very, very sad. Oh, this is my brother. I've always wanted to use my picture of my brother in a slide, so I thought this would be the perfect opportunity. I just really want to compare haircuts. Uh, don't tell him I did this. Anyway, so my brother is a, uh, I thought this was kind of a cool example, a little way to think about experience design. Uh, my brother's not a designer, has nothing to do with experience. He is a network forensics expert at a, um, at a giant uh, in financial services company. And I asked, well, what, what, what does a network forensics expert do all day? And he says, I wake up every day and just assume we've been hacked. And my job is to find out how. So he's, he looks at the lens of like, he, the, the, there is a vulnerability. And he spends his whole day trying to. And most days he doesn't find anything. And I guess that's a good day. Uh, but I think with, with brands and experience design, most people assume everything's fine. You know? but, 
but I think if you look at it through the lens of, I'm assuming people are having a bad experience or we can improve something, how am I gonna do it? And we have different hair cuts. So the thing is that when expectations for consumers are not met, brands typically get dumped. So who in this room has had a bad experience with a brand? What has it caused? Typically, you abandon the brand, you abort them, and you go somewhere else and spend your money. The thing is, it takes 12 positive experiences in order to undo the damage that has been caused by that one bad experience. And as Mike likes to say... Oh, so, so if we blow it today, we're going to have to write 12 really great blog posts in order to, to make up for it. Let but us we're know. we're trying. We're trying. Uh -huh. And working the clickers hard. Uh, you need your customers more than they need you. Who in the room has competitors? Everyone's hand should be up. What are you actively doing to make sure that your customers don't go somewhere else with their business? It's proven fact that it is cheaper to actually retain a customer than it is to acquire a new one. In addition, 55% of customers due to the competition are actually willing to pay more money for a guaranteed better experience. Just think about that. Why would I pay $100 more when I can just go pay 50 bucks for something? Well, because of the experience that that brand provides me with. And the focus is not on the business anymore. It focuses on the business and not on the relationship. So instead of brands being focused around providing a better experience for their customer, they become task driven. So if they were to refocus on customers, they would be able to provide a better experience and become leaders in their industry. So like leaders like Apple and Southwest and Uber who care about the experience that they're providing their customers with. Never heard of them. Never heard of those companies? Yeah. Uh, in addition, 90% of customers will actually stop doing business with a brand due to bad customer service or experience. So what happens along the way? Well, like I said, brands forget about their customers. And they forget how to actually provide their customers with value and experience that makes them stand out. And many times, brands will wake up and they'll think to themselves, oh, our customers are happy and satisfied. And while this might be a fact, the real mindset that most businesses should have is, our customers are unhappy and dissatisfied with our brand. So every day, we should be working to provide a better experience. So they're constantly, obsessing, constantly obsessing over the experience that they're providing their customers with, which I don't think obsession is a bad thing, especially when you're talking about the, the, especially when you're talking about the experience that you're delivering your customers. That's why I'm constantly refining these jokes. Keep working. Keep working. <laughs> so let's talk about Charter Communications. Everyone here is familiar with Charter. Charter is a provider of residential and business high-speed internet and Wi-Fi in, in the St. Louis area. So a while ago, Charter started to notice that there was an increase in call, call value to their call center. And customers were complaining about things like the bill. The problem with the bill was that it was printed in black and white in order to save money because the bills were so long. Well, why were the bills so long? Well, hold on, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, the Charter CEO came in and started to ask questions about this increase in call volume and the complaints that they were having. And he asked, what if we removed an entire page of legal copy that people don't necessarily read? Or why is it there in the first place? So. What did they do? They broke down the internal silos and met, to get, met across borders internally to talk about ways to make the experience better. So customer service, legal, design came together and looked at the bill and analyzed it. And in return, they were able to reduce one page of legal down to one inch, which allowed for them to print the bill in color, which allowed for them to group by colors in order for customers to better understand the bill. The results, lower call volume to their call center and happier customers. So they achieved their business goals of lowering their operating costs and also achieved the goal of having satisfied customers at the end of the day that were loyal to their brand. Design. How, how did they do that? How did they do that, Mike? Design. Design. They created an experience by using design as a tool. But how did they do that? Well, that's what we're going to get into now. Oops. So there are three things that you should be doing in order to create the best experience for your brand. The first is defining goals and objectives. Next up, conducting research, and then actually mapping the journey that your customers take with your brand. So let's start with defining objectives, defining objectives and goals. Every brand has them. These are the ways that brands measure success. But what does a successful experience 
look like for your brand, and how can you design for that? Well, if you ever spent time in a cornfield and you know what this picture is, these are silos. Nobody laughs at my jokes. I was going to say, say cows. Aw, no, cows no, too. No. Uh, these are silos. And the thing about silos is that most companies have them. And in order to increase communication, internal communication, you have to break down these silos. So it's about marketing and C-suite and sales and legal working together in order to create a better experience and deliver that experience for their customers. And empathy, being empathetic as a brand allows for you to step into the shoes of your customers and see things from their viewpoint. So say you are a, a business owner. Have you taken time to fill out the form of your website? Or have you visited your store and seen what the experience is like for your customers? Or have you taken the time to pick up the phone and call your business and understand what people are hearing? Those are things that you should always be doing. Seeing things from the viewpoint of your customers allows for you to always be thinking and evolving to create a better experience for them at the end of the day. In addition, what brand doesn't like a small dollar sign on the cost side and a large dollar sign on the revenue side? No little, jokes? The little cost is adorable. It is very adorable. It's adorable. It's like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so by lowering your cost and increasing your revenue, you are able to create a better experience not only for the business, but also for your customers. Next up, conducting research. Research allows brands to look at their Look at their consumers and also under, and look at the experience that their consumers are having with their brand. And while there are a multitude of methods and techniques for doing research, I'm only going to cover a few of them to just give you a general idea of how you can start to use research to better your brand and the experience your consumers have with your brand. So quantitative, quantitative research looks at things like time on page, user flow, analytics, or that information, that data that was collected with that call center. These are ways to better understand more of the digital and numerical things and nonverbal cues of the, your consumers. While qualitative research is more focused on communication. So imagine conducting interviews or doing focus groups or conducting observations. These look at the verbal cues of your customers in order to allow you to get a better lens into how they feel about your brand. Another way of doing this is by actually taking a chart or a piece of paper or a whiteboard or whatever and putting your customer at the center of your brand. By putting your customer at the center of your brand, you are able to ask questions like, what are they? So, for instance, what are they thinking? What are they seeing? What are they saying? And what are they hearing when they hear your brand? By understanding that, those things, then you're able to better understand the experience of your customers. Oh, look at those good-looking people. Hello. Hello. And we're on the right side, too. Yeah, we did, we, did we did it. We did it. Nice. Uh, after you have gathered all that information, then you are able to create personas. And personas are not like they used to be. Per typically, a per used to be a persona was things like age, location, demographic, income base. But nowadays, personas look at things like your behaviors and your needs and wants. So let's talk about behaviors. Behaviors are, the, are a group of users that support a brand. So for an airline, it would be, the behavior would be a frequent flyer or an infrequent flyer or a family f of travelers or a leisure, leisurely traveler. I've never left this stage. You've never left the state. <laughs> While needs and wants look at the expectations of the users. So for instance, my needs as a frequent traveler is I want a quick experience with an airline. Whereas Mike, being an infrequent traveler, needs more of a detailed, understandable breakdown of when booking his travel. And lastly, journey mapping. By understanding the journey of your customers, then you are able to provide a better experience. So let's take a look at journey mapping in itself. And we will use the airline example because we've already seen it once. So let's go with the airline. Let's do it. So in order to actually map the journey, you can only look at it from one perspective. So we will use Mike's, Mike Spikowski as an infrequent traveler who needs a detailed outline of options and explanations around booking travel. Did you do your research on this one? I did. Yeah. I might have booked a few trips for right. you. Yeah. yeah. So the first step in laying out the journey map is looking at the customer steps. These are the things that they do at each phase in order to progress from start to finish through the, through the journey through your brand. So for instance, there's the planning, the booking, pre-flight, flying, and arrival. 
Underneath that, you will find the actions. These are the things that the steps cause. So the action of planning involves someone actually having to visit a website. And the action of pre-flight means you have to check into your actual flight. Underneath that is touch points. Touch points are interactions, are interactions that brands are able to make with consumers in order to create a meaningful and lasting experience. So when you think about pre-flight, well, when you, before you check in, you have to get an email. And you want that email to be very detailed and very understandable and easy to navigate. So those are some things that go into the thinking around designing the experience for a pre-flight check-in. And lastly are the pain points. These are the things that get in the way of your consumers actually achieving the goal from start to finish with your, with your brand. So, for instance, Mike's pain point around planning and booking is the website's hard to navigate. There's no ease of use. It's not very understandable. And lastly, after you've laid all this stuff out, and one way to lay all this out is by either using just sticky notes, a marker, and some red, yellow, and green dots in order to prioritize things. So as you'll see on the screen here, we've used dots to prioritize the actions that need to be taken first. So obviously red means high priority. So in order to know where to start, I look at the red dots and realize, hey, in order for my consumers to be able to book a trip with me, they have to be able to understand my website. So that's where I need to take action first. I need to make sure the website is understandable and an easy flow for consumers to actually get through. In addition, there's a pain point around check-in. Maybe the email is not as understandable as I think it is. Maybe I need to look at it from the lens of Mike, who doesn't understand the pre-flight check-in process. <laughs> you got nothing. I've checked you in for a flight before, just no. Another way of looking at the customer journey is by asking the five whys. So let's use that story around charter communications that we spoke about earlier about the call center volume and the customer complaints. So the first statement that the business makes is customer call volume at call centers is extremely high. Why? Customers are confused by their bill. Well, why? Because it isn't easy to read. Why? Because it's so long. Why? Because we had to print in black and white and to include the one page of legal copy at the end. Why? Well, you've reached the end of these whys, and by this time, you started to uncover some things like customers are not being able to understand the bill. The bill is too long. They can't break it down due to the fact that it's all one color. So what can we do to provide a better experience? Well, they condensed the legal section and color-coded the bills for easy understanding, which allowed for a lower call center volume. So Charter was able to address the pain points understand their customers, and achieve business goals all in the same breath. Design. Design. That's what we're talking about, right? Yep. Design. So are we, oh, we're, oh, thanks. Uh, I'm just going to stand here. So why are we talking about any of this stuff again? Uh, I really think like experience is becoming more and more important. I think as apps and uh, digital products become more uh, part of our lives, that experiences are the new barrier to competition. Right? I think all brands want to be competitive and they always look for ways to uh, sort of outdo competition. And I think experiences are going to be these new things that define uh, uh, loyalty and, and ease of sale. Uh, if you think about like all the, the apps in the app store, there's probably 200 photo apps, but you probably only use maybe one or two. Well, why? You know? uh, so I think, I think experiences are, are They're catching on, yeah. They're catching on. Uh, so it's kind of faded out of the lights on, but whatever. There's this author uh, I always talk about named Marty, N uh, hmm. Marty Neumeyer. Uh, it's early. He's written books like The Brand Gap and Zag and The Designful Company and 46 Rules of Genius and all these awesome books on design and, and sort of business. Uh, and he says a designer is anyone who could change the current situation into a more favorable one. And that's how I really frame a lot of uh, the work we do or the way we think about it, and especially around uh, framing experience design, because it's not about creating artifacts, it's about this push for improvement. So just like a logo alone doesn't make up a brand or colors don't make up a brand or it's not about just a particular piece of type or something, uh, design isn't just visuals. Design is this uh, sort of transformational tool that businesses can use. Uh, I think it's bigger than artifacts. It's bigger than just a website that will be you know, obsolete in five years or a brochure that you'll want to revisit every three years. It's the idea uh, behind these things that drive it. Uh, and I think design is a way of thinking for improvement. 
Um, and I think when cultures and businesses can get in line with the idea of design for improvement and start to think about customer problems and how they can use design to fill in these gaps, it becomes this powerful tool. Um, and so it's such a buzzword. It's if we're throwing around buzzwords, I'll throw out innovate. Uh, but Marty Neumeyer has this line that says, if you want to innovate, which means if you want to improve products and, and move past competition, you have to design. And he doesn't mean you have to make a, a cool website. It's like you have to have this active um, philosophy and approach of improvement. <laughs> and that's all we've learned about experience design. Any, any questions? Any questions? <laughs> See, they clap again for you. Go ahead. Go ahead.